time. I would like to very briefly introduce Willow. But first of all, I would like to say that uh, I'm really glad that there are so many participants. Although, on the other hand, it shouldn't be surprising for me because Willow's webinars are always packed right to the brim. Yes, so there are always many people. Uh, you are your own uh, brand name. Yes, so Willow Barnowski is, is a very good brand name, upmarket brand name. I would like to tell all of you that Willow is an educator and she is a writer at the same time uh, from California, San Jose. She is also, uh, she has been in Poland uh, virtually for a while, uh, or traditionally also. Right now she is the virtual English uh, language fellow at the University of Opole in this academic year. And uh, in the previous academic year, she played the, the same role uh, in, the, at the, in the university, at the University of, of Rzeszów, 19 uh, to 20. As far as her areas of expertise are uh, concerned, um, she has experience in teaching uh, English as a second language, as a foreign language. Uh, she's also instructor, professional developer, and uh, a person specifying in many areas of education. So adult education, university, and language institute contexts. And she has been teaching in many different countries, among others in Japan, South Korea, and of course, Poland. And uh, as far as her webinars for IATEC in Poland are concerned, uh, she started in 2019 to 20, and she had uh, four webinars uh, for IATEC. The first one about critical thinking, then the next one about identifying the language bias, then uncreative writing, and finally, uh, grading and ungrading. So that was, uh, that uh, I mentioned just some of them, but if you would like to, 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 to watch some of these recordings, they are all available on uh, our YouTube, IATF in Poland YouTube channel. So you can, you can watch that. Um, and as far as today's uh, uh, session is concerned, uh, Willow will tell us uh, about the importance of controlling uh, negative phenomena such as bullying and the importance of creating empathetic and engaged community uh, which will control situations which are on the verge of bullying. And uh, she will, she will uh, model and teach our students, uh, she will tell us how to model and teach our students to respond to acts of everyday bullying and, uh, and intolerance in the classroom and outside the classroom as well. And uh, she will also help us uh, create inclusive classroom. Inclusive classroom is the idea, of inclusive positive classroom is the idea that I'm sure that uh, all of us are interested in. So over to you, Willow. Thank you so much, Litsina, for that very friendly um, introduction. And as Litsina said, I'll be talking about responding to bullying and intolerance. Um, I am in the United States, and I'm sure many of you have heard about some of the recent acts of violence um, against Asian Americans. So if this is a topic that's really close to my heart, because I think that if we teach our students to um, be inclusive and we have classrooms that are really friendly, warm and um, close-knit communities, we can reduce um, the sort of violence or intolerance that happens in our largest societies. And as you heard, I'm in California, I'm in San Jose right now. And I've been lucky enough to be able to give presentations and webinars with great organizations like IATEFL Poland through the consulate in Krakow, the embassy in Warsaw, and the regional English language office in Tallinn, Estonia. Right now, I'm teaching grad students at the University of Opole, um, and they have just been an absolute dream to teach, as I greatly enjoy teaching students at Jeju uh, when I was in Poland. So now that you know a little bit about me and where I am, I wanted to ask you to put in the chat where you're living now. I see that we have someone here from India. 
Um, and what's your teaching or training context? Are you a teacher trainer? Are you teaching preschool, high school, university? Let me know a little bit about who's here and I can respond to a few of the, of the uh, chat messages. Okay, so we have some, Monoli is in preschool, great. High school in Poland, wonderful. Another uh, teacher in high school, preschool in India, wonderful. Uh, teaching one-to-one, -one. great. High school in Georgia, wow. It's wonderful how Ayatuffel Poland attracts teachers from all over Poland and even from other countries. That's really great to be able to share ideas with people from all around the world. Technical school in Poland, high school in Poland. Wonderful. Okay, so I, you can continue to say where you're from in the chat. I'm going to continue uh, because we have a lot that I want to talk about and we're starting a, a wee bit late today, but we should be fine. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Learning for Justice organization that I kind of based this presentation on. We're going to talk a little bit about the term tolerance and why it can be problematic. And we'll talk about bullying, the definition, some examples, something called a bullying circle. And then we'll talk about some phrases and words that we can use in response to bullying. And there'll be some examples for role play scenarios that you could use with your students. And I also did a, a survey with some of my students in Opole and Jeju, but I just, you know, asked if you have free time, could you just re uh, respond to the survey? Um, and a few students responded and gave me some of their thoughts about how we could stop bullying uh, and their experiences witnessing or experiencing bullying. So I think that you'll find that useful. And then I will share some sources and resources, and I hope that you will share some of your experiences. So learningforjustice.org is this really fantastic organization that I often talk about in different webinars. If you haven't checked it out, you should. And it used to be called teachingtolerance.org, but the organization changed its name. And one of the reasons they gave is that they wanted to move the focus of their organization from reducing prejudice to actually pointedly supporting actions to fight injustices and to create a more just world. So that might seem like a subtle distinction, but I think it seems much more proactive um, to be thinking about what we're working towards instead of what we're trying to move away from. Um, and the word tolerance in general can sort of have this connotation of something negative. I, I will use this word. I, I, you know, I used it. I, I'll use it a lot. The title of this presentation has to do with, you know, bullying and tolerance. But the term tolerance itself can mean something, uh, uh, as these two definitions show, something about um, accepting people you don't agree with or don't approve of or beliefs you don't approve of or don't agree with. And that seems pretty negative. And also the other definition of the ability to deal with something unpleasant or annoying. And I find that to be the really problematic definition because we don't want to be teaching our students to tolerate other students. And we as teachers shouldn't feel that we're tolerating students. Um, we would like to be thinking in a more positive way. So some terms I've seen and used um, are things like rather than working towards tolerance, we're working towards community building. We're working towards inclusivity, uh, justice, or good citizenship. Oftentimes teachers will talk about um, students having good classroom citizenship or being good citizens in the class. And that's another term you can use depending on the connotation in your country for what, what that means. And this is the, the um, resource that I got a lot of these ideas from. I'm at, I added my own ideas and I also used different resources, but the basic framework for today's presentation comes from um, this uh, resource from Learning for Justice called Speak Up at School, How to Respond to Everyday Prejudice, Bias, and Stereotypes. So we're really going to be widely defining bullying and tolerance will be, you know, can be um, we can cover many, many different areas, many different reasons why students might be bullied or might be treated in a way that's not inclusive. And I think that um, one really great, great quotation, the beginning of this resource is from Martin Luther King Jr. And it says that 
in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So I think that can be a powerful quotation to share with your students as we're developing students um, ability and confidence in speaking up and helping um, to prevent and stop bullying. I would say when it comes to bullying, students might remember both the words of their enemies um, and the silence of their friends, but I think it's still a great quote um, to raise awareness about um, our, the need for us to stand up and speak up when we see something wrong. So I wanted to ask you to give me your answer in the chat box um, because I wanted to see what do you think of when you think about bullying? Like how would you define bullying? What kind of behaviors would you view as bullying in the school context? So if you can just type your answer in the chat, I will respond. So there might be a lag. Okay, now I'm seeing some answers. So Agnieszka said, treating others in a way that is hurtful, abusive, intimidating, threatening. Yes, that's great. Cause that encompasses not just physical bullying but also verbal bullying, being cruel to weaker people, uh, problematic behavior. Yeah, the, and that's a great general way to look at it too, but different types of problematic behavior, acts of hostility. Great. Yes, yeah, so it seems like we're pretty much on the same page about the definition of bullying. So I also wanted to share this resource with you um, that's a bullying prevention program that I think you might find interesting. Uh, it's called the Alveus Bullying Prevention Program created by Dan Alveus. And he defined bullying, I mean, I'm trying to move this chat box out of the way so I can see my slides. Um, as when someone is exposed repeatedly and over time to negative actions on the part of one or more people and they have difficulty defending themselves. So uh, bullying, he said the bullying is aggressive, it's unwanted negative actions, and it's a pattern of behavior repeated over time. So maybe we wouldn't call it bullying if it's just a one-time thing, one person's having a bad day, but this would be something that happens, you know, happens often. Um, or it involves, and it involves some kind of imbalance of power or strength. So one of you mentioned, Anya mentioned being cruel to weaker people. And I think that um, there, there is a power imbalance when it comes to bullying, but it's not always necessarily that a person is weaker in the conventional sense. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but there definitely is some sort of power imbalance involved. So let me ask you now, why do students get bullied? What have you seen um, as, a, as a student or as a teacher? Uh, what, what are some reasons why students might be targeted for bullying? Because of their background, religious, ethnic, cultural background. Yes, definitely, unfortunately. Anything else? Because they're different in some way. Physical appearance. Mm -hmm. And I'll wait for one more response because they have something that the attacker doesn't. Yes, and skin color, yes. Um, yes, and Sebastian, you said something that I wanted to, to point out too. So I think traditionally when we think of why students get bullied, we think that the student might be perceived as being less than in some way or the student might be perceived as not having something um, or being different in some way but also a student could be bullied because of envy or because students think, oh, that student is the teacher's favorite. You know, we have lots of expressions, I'm sure in every language for like the teacher's pet 
the brown noser, like all these expressions to talk about students that maybe are too close to the teachers. Sometimes uh, students might get bullied uh, for having a lot of money, not just for not having a lot of money. Um, and so there are many different reasons that students can be bullied. And I think that it's really important when we talk to our students about bullying that we remind them of that because if students think that the only people that get bullied are people who are perceived as less than the other students, then of course students are gonna be really unwilling to report when they're bullied because they feel like that's an admission of being weird or, or different or less than their other, their classmates. So I think we need to make sure that we include that there are many different reasons why students get bullied and it doesn't always mean that student is not as popular or that student is um, perceived in a negative light um, or a lesser light or as being inferior. Um, but certainly many times it is because students are perceived as being different in a, in a negative way um, by one student or more. <laughs> I think someone has their microphone on. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this bullying circle, which is from the Alveus program. I found this really interesting because I thought this is a nice visual for when we talk to students about bullying, especially maybe younger students that need to have a visual to talk about or think about it. So this visual talks about all of the different roles that people can play in a bullying situation. So for so H, uh, the person in the center, that's the student who is being bullied. And this is the student who's exposed. So you can see they're standing alone in the center of this you know, circle. It's not exactly a circle, but it's called a circle. Anyway, and then A is the student who's bullying. Um, and so, and also we wanna be careful with language. Uh, a student isn't, uh, a, a being a bully isn't a, a permanent characteristic. So it's better to say a student who is bullying, student who's engaging in bullies, bullying behaviors, because if we label a child permanently as a bully and just always refer to that child as a bully or that person as a bully, that becomes their identity, right? So the student who's engaging in the bullying, the student who's being a bully, um, is the person that starts the bullying and takes an active part. And then there's B, which would be one or more people who are following the bully. They're taking an active part, but they didn't plan it or they didn't necessarily plan uh, the bullying or initiate it. And then you have C, which are some supporters. These are people who are supporting the bully uh, and the bullying, but they're not taking an active part. Then you have the passive supporters who actually, for some reason, like the bully. Maybe they enjoy it because they're not being bullied, um, but they're not displaying open support. Then you have the disengaged onlookers, E. They're watching what's happening, but they don't say or anything. They don't do anything. And then F, possible defenders are the students who are the people who are, they don't like the bullying. They feel like they should do something, but they don't do it. And then lastly uh, is G, and G would be a person who actually stands up for the bullied student, doesn't like the bullying, and does something to try to help. So when you talk to your students about bullying, I think this could be something that you could show them. Um, and, uh, and if you, I mentioned later about making up classroom rules at the beginning of the semester, uh, you might want to make things maybe more clear, say to students, like, in this class, I'd like us all to be G, right? Um, and as, especially as, as teachers, of course, we, we should always be G, but helping students, um, kind of giving students that like over explicit permission that if you see something wrong happening, say something or do something so that students know they have your permission to actually stand up for people who are being bullied. Some students might not know that the teacher wants them to do that. Some students might have gotten in trouble in the past for defending someone uh, or for speaking up. They might have been, um, they might have felt that they were bothering the teacher by talking about something. So we want to make sure that we explicitly tell students how we would like them to respond to situations of bullying, because that's not obviously something we all naturally know how to do. Uh, or we wouldn't have such a big issue with it. And one of the other things I really liked about the um, Learning for Justice site is they're talking about the fact that 
as I said, because we're not necessarily, we don't necessarily naturally instinctively know what to say or do, we often freeze in situations, even as the instructor, especially if you are an instructor or a teacher who maybe you've had a situation in the past with someone bullying you. Bullying can happen at work um, also, or you might've been bullied as a child and that can be really difficult for you in that moment to know how to react. So the Learning for Justice site says we should really have a plan for how we respond, have some phrases maybe that we have in the back of our head, um, you know, even explicitly have things on the wall, these expressions that students can use, have some templates, sentence starters, so that if students see something, they can maybe even glance at the wall, especially if you have a class where they're speaking, you know, they're speaking English and they're not native English speakers. Um, it can, in a stressful situation, all of their English might go out the window to remind them what they could say. So here are a few. Uh, phrases or things that you can say in response to someone being bullied. And we'll talk a little bit later, maybe about some like dividing out what a teacher would say versus what a student would say, but these are just sort of some general phrases. So for example, I'm surprised to hear you say that, you know, as a teacher um, or, you know, a student could say that to a friend, you're pointing out that there's something about what that student has just said that is off, right, or inappropriate. I don't think that's funny. That's a very clear statement. Um, letting the person know that you don't think that's appropriate. Uh, what do you mean by that? That's giving the person a chance to either repeat what they said um, or to rephrase it or to realize that, oh, what I just said sounded, it didn't sound like I meant it to, or you know that's not what I meant by that. Uh, why would you say something like that? Could be another phrase that you would use. Um, did you mean to say something hurtful when you said that? And of course, this all depends on the age of students that you're working with, right? Certain age of student would not respond well <laughs> to certain statements or questions. Um, using that word as a put down offends me. So put down or an insult. Uh, using that word as an insult offends me. Using that word doesn't help others feel safe or accepted here. So especially if you've been building all year or consistently talking about how the classroom is a space where you're all learning and everybody needs to feel accepted and safe so they can focus on their schoolwork. That's something that you could bring up if you're dealing with um, an inappropriate language or behavior. It's not okay to whatever. It's not okay to hit our friends. It's not okay to throw someone's book on the floor. It's not okay to call someone a name. It's not okay to use that word. Um, and that I found when I worked with quite young children was really great because it, rather than saying, you can't say that, you shouldn't say that, um, stop saying that, which it can be really direct and face threatening. It was like, I was repeating a rule, like just sort of, it was a little more distant from the student, like, oh, okay, it's not okay to say that. And the students responded really well to that, especially young students. And also it's such a simple phrase that students could then repeat it to other students. Like, it's not okay to do that, you know? Um, or something like in our classroom or in our school, we don't call names or we don't hit our friends or you know whatever. As, as you get older, hopefully you wouldn't have to be, you, be reminding students not to hit each other. And another way that you can really uh, work on coming up with some phrases is if you really know your students and what they're going through. So um, if you have the students have, have buy-in in the classroom and they have a lot of ownership of the classroom and at the beginning of the year, maybe you have some rules from last year, you in general have rules and you ask students to add a few more rules or you have students get together and come up with all of the classroom rules. But by doing that and asking students to come up with some rules for desirable behaviors and language, uh, undesirable behaviors and language, then you can really see what's going on with that group of students. If they're bringing up certain words or phrases that they don't like or behaviors, they're probably telling you and sending you a message that those sorts of things do happen or have been happening. Um, and then together brainstorming some appropriate responses. Um, like, what do you do if someone does use that name in class? Or what do you do if you see someone hurting someone? It's another way of having that conversation to let students know I, ex I expect you to help each other. I expect you to stand up for each other. Um, ways to communicate. What do you do if someone's bullying someone and you need help? Uh, what do you do if you're being bullied? So having some sort of things in place, like maybe you, um, you know, students are free to send you, uh, to give you an anonymous letter on your desk, or they can send you an email about something, or 
from time to time, you might do online like a survey that doesn't take any event identifying information to ask about how students are doing in class and if everyone's welcoming them, et cetera. Uh, I do that, especially if I have newer students or students from maybe a different background or another country and they're the minority in a class, I wanna make sure that they're being accepted and they feel that they're being um, supported in class. Uh, you can also talk about consequences, like, you know, maybe, you know, if this happens in class, the student has to get sent to the office, or if this happens in class, the student has to, you know, leave the class uh, for the safety of the other students. So having, you know, students brainstorm that is a really great way of you being able to see what's going on with your students. And also, you kind of get to gauge which things hurt your students and which things affect them. Because even if, even for some teachers who might say, look, I'm not a parent in the classroom. I'm there to teach my students. I'm there to teach a subject. I'm not there to, you know, um, you know, make sure they turn out to be good people. I mean, I would hope most teachers wouldn't say that, but I know some, some feel that way, that it's all about the subject. It's all about the learning. But the fact is that students can't learn if they're sitting there stressed out because someone in class has, you know, taken their lunch or someone in class has told them they don't like them, or there's some sort of interpersonal conflict or they're fearing for their physical safety. So of course that student will not be able to focus on learning in the lesson. Okay, so another thing that we can do is as we're letting students know, we, you know, I want you to speak up. I want you to stand up for other people. I want you to be um, you know, a good citizen. We have to keep in mind though, that we have to remember that students need to stay safe and that we don't want students to, every, to think that, you know, jumping into a physical altercation is always a good idea. So depending on the situation and you know the students, if a student comes to you and talks to you about some sort of situation um, that they maybe they wanna speak up because their friend is making fun of someone else. Um, you, you know, you can talk, to, talk them through it, um, tell them like, you know, maybe what words they could use uh, and talk to them about safety. Like if you say something, is this person maybe going to push you or hurt you? Like, you know, let's, let's make sure that you're physically safe. Um, and to, when they give feedback to remember to focus on the behavior. If they're telling a friend, for example, not to say use of racist language, just saying to the friend, you're a racist probably won't be helpful, but saying like, you say this word sometimes and that word is racist and I, I don't think that's okay, that could have a different, um, you know, that, that could get gain a, uh, could get a different reaction for, for saying it that way um, instead of calling the person a name. And that's what avoid labeling people means. So of course, if, there, if, a, if a student comes to you about a situation of bullying within their own, your own class, you should be of course taking care of that. But if a student maybe has another class or outside of school or they have some other situation that they're dealing with and, and they want to have some more, some encouragement or the courage to speak up, then these are some things that you can keep in mind. This is a quotation from the Learning for Justice um, uh, program about fighting bullying. And one of the pieces of advice is to interrupt it every time. So every time there's an act of intolerance, every time there's something um, uh, you know, biased or some type of bullying that happens, immediately respond to it. So interrupt it every time in the moment without exception. And I will say that I'm sharing all this great advice to you. And I will, this is something I'm working on myself too, because it is hard sometimes to interrupt a lesson to respond to something. Sometimes a student might say something that is so shocking you, you can't react. Um, definitely many times, especially with older students, because I teach adults and I teach older students, um, I find that the older the student, often the worse their reaction if you talk to them in front of other people. They often, it's often best to take them aside, message them privately or talk to them privately, depending on the situation. At the same time, if you do that though, then the other students don't get to witness you giving feedback on that, you know, behavior, that language. So, you know, it's up to you sometimes, you know, it, it's best to respond in the moment, but sometimes you might want to wait if you feel the students wouldn't respond well, but it's always good too to let the rest of the class know, like, I, I saw that or I heard that, it's not okay, I'm dealing with it, even if you don't necessarily deal with it in the moment. So Sonia Galavis, um, a teacher in Idaho said, stop what you're doing, address it. 
So she's teaching a math lesson and she hears a student make a biased remark. She addresses it in the moment. She never lets it pass. Anytime you let it pass, it's an opportunity missed. And I think this really applies too, especially with really young children because young children can be such mimics uh, and also young children have a shorter attention span. So if something happens to immediately say something and especially those of you who work with younger children, um, you know, you see how they can just start mimicking everything the teacher says. So um, that's really great if you have those students are used to hearing you say that's not okay or that's hurtful or we don't use that word here or in our class we don't say this. If the students start repeating that that's really good because then you'll end up having the whole class kind of on the same page. So here are some um, example responses from teaching for justice that um, or learning for justice um, in terms of depending on like what grade your students are and the, this you know this is an organization that's US based and some of the, the wording might be a little um, you, you might want to adapt it for your background or your context maybe you don't speak to your students quite so bluntly or maybe you speak to your students more bluntly but these are some examples so if you're teaching pre-k through second graders you might say something like you know there are words that hurt, words like stupid or ugly. Well, there are other words that hurt and this is one of them. So that's why we don't use this word. So you don't, with a child that young, you don't have to explain the historical background. You don't have to talk about, you don't necessarily have to go into all the reasons why that specific word is so problematic, depending on the you know child's maturity level, et cetera. Um, but it's really important to just immediately kind of say like, okay, that's a word we don't use. So the student gets immediate feedback. Uh, for grades three and five, students are older, they can get more information, they can manage more information about something. So you could say something like that word carries a lot of weight or it carries more weight than you know, it can really hurt people. There's a lot of emotion around that word that's been used, word, it's been used to attack people. So especially if you're talking about words like words used to attack someone of a different race or a different sexual orientation or a different gender identity or words that are used to insult women, Etc. Um, the student might not know that that's a you know a targeted slur, and they might need a little bit of background on why that word is is so wrong. Um, and also saying to the student like I know you're not meaning to attack anyone, but if someone hears that they might feel attacked. We won't, don't want that here. We want everyone to feel safe. So let's not use that word. So a little more logic, a little more explanation for a slightly older student to kind of explain a little bit about why the word is not appropriate and what you're going for in the classroom. Sorry, okay. And then for middle grades, um, you know, when you know the students a little better or you feel that they should already know that a certain term is inappropriate saying, you know, that you know that word's hurtful. I'm surprised to hear you say it. There's no place for it here. Uh, we have an agreement or we have a contract that we don't use that language. You need to honor that agreement. Again, it depends on the students. Some students, if you say, you know, um, you know that word's hurtful, they might be so embarrassed. Or if you say, I need you to honor that agreement, they might become really resistant. So of course, you know your students and how best to respond, um, but this can work for a lot of middle grade students. And then upper grades, um, if a student has done or said something that you know they know they shouldn't have done, uh, Tina, that's not appropriate and you know it, I need you to stop it or there'll be more serious consequences. So. In the case of the upper grades, one would hope that those students already have, you know, they've heard the explanations before, they know why it's not right, like you don't need to spend five minutes going over the historical background of that term, you need, just need to set a firm boundary. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about this survey that I did with my students. So I um, surveyed some of my uh, undergrad and grad students in Poland and I got 14 responses. So it's a very small survey. This isn't meant to be, you know, this a huge statement on how, what every student in Poland thinks about bullying in the classroom. But 14 students respond. 13 said yes, they have witnessed bullying at school or experienced it. And they almost everyone said it was in primary and secondary school. One person said in university. Of course, bullying can happen in university, grad school, work, the home. It can happen anywhere. Um, 13 of them said that it was they saw or there were um there of the responses there were 13 that said that, that people had seen students do bullying 
And then because they could answer, they could give one or more answers, seven uh, also said that they had seen a teacher or a staff engaging in bullying. So, you know, that's really, that's really sad to think that, you know, students at school, you know, we, that we're not making sure that they're feeling safe and that they might actually be being bullied by us, by our peers who are educational professionals. So that is really something that we need to, you know, hopefully eliminate. Um, and then as far as um, have they seen any appropriate or effective responses to bullying? Did they ever see anything that was done that was really helpful or that worked to stop or prevent bullying? And there were five yes answers and they gave some um, suggestions too. So um, four of five students who responded said that the teacher's response is what stopped the bullying. So they said that, uh, for example, a teacher stepped in, the teacher called the parents and the teacher continued to address this issue with students until the bullying stopped. Although the respondent said that wasn't always effective. But if you think about uh, what we talked about, the fact that bullying is this ongoing thing. Bullying isn't one time, bullying is something that happens often. Of course, it makes sense that if we just say stop at one time, that's not gonna take care of the problem. We need to really be willing to be proactive and to also be reactive like immediately and, and trying to stop it every time. Um, and then one of the students said that their parent got involved when the school didn't help and their parent was actually able to, to get the bullying to stop. So I asked these students to give some suggestions um, in terms of like, as, as you know, these are university and grad school students and looking back at primary and secondary school, wh what do they think would have been helpful to either stop the bullying or to, um, you know, cut down on the bullying. And there, I don't have all of their responses here. They actually wrote a lot that I was really impressed by their responses, but they kind of all fell into the category of education, communication, reaction, support, and consequences. So um, students, a lot of them said that schools and teachers should definitely be educating students about bullying and its effects. So it's not something that we can just say like, well, if I don't talk about it, it won't happen. Or of course my students wouldn't bully each other. It's something that needs to be directly addressed. Um, and a student shared a video. And um, if you message me or email me, for this uh, PDF, I can, uh, it has all the links on it, but this is a YouTube video. I think it might be called something like crumpled paper, but the, in the video, it talks about the fact that even if a bully or even if someone who's been bullying someone apologizes or says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, whatever, the harm has already been done and you can't just take away, some things just can't be resolved with an apology. So it's a way of getting students who might bully others to think about the long-term effects that the bullying can have. And students who have been enabling bullying or not doing anything or supporting bullying can see, wow, I'm actually, my actions are having this really strong effect maybe on someone's you know, future life. Um, another thing is that if teachers have really trusting relationships with their students, then the students will be more likely to report bullying both in and out of school. So, of course, we know if our students feel comfortable with us and they trust us, they're more likely to tell us if they have a problem or if something's happening or if they witness a problem. Uh, another thing was, another piece of advice was that schools should provide mental health support, make sure that the students have access to good psychologists um, who will maintain anonymity, you know, as, as much as they can and help the students. Uh, and that students who engage in the bullying should receive an appropriate consequence. So someone mentioned, you know, some students who have engaged in bullying, they might be terrified to talk to, just go to the, you know, the teacher's office. That might be enough to make them stop. And another student might need to have their parents called before they stop. You know, depending on the student, uh, the consequence has to actually be something that will work towards preventing or stopping the behavior something that's appropriate for the action. Um, and that if there's some really serious bullying, parents should definitely be involved. Um, and that parents and teachers should respond, as I mentioned before, every time they witness the bullying, including verbal bullying. So every time the teacher lets something go, that's kind of being reinforced. And also, you know, as teachers, we strive to be fair. So if we've let one student get away with saying a term, but then not another student, we're opening ourselves up to this accusation of like, why are you picking on the student or why aren't you treating the students equally? So uh, another thing that they said is that 
bullying should definitely not be defended as normal behavior. So um, for sure, that's something that if, you know, if a teacher says something like, oh, you know, boys will be boys, um, or the, the thing that used to be said, I don't, I don't know if it's still said, but I know that when I was a child, if a boy would pick on a girl, they would be told, oh, it just means he likes you, it's no big deal. So a student is coming to you and <laughs> complaining about behavior that upsets them, and we need to make sure that we're not just dismissing it or saying it's normal or it's okay, because obviously if it's upsetting the student, it, it's probably not okay. Um, they also said that to make sure that teachers are fairly responding to the bullying. So I, it's not easy if you have a student in your class who is the son or daughter of a friend, or you know that child has a parent that's really picky or that parent might complain or that parent won't receive this well if, if, if you call out their student for, or their child for doing something wrong. But these students said, you know, if, if a child comes from a wealthy family, a privileged family, there's some kind of connection, you still have to respond to the bullying because those can be the kids that get away with bullying because they know they can do whatever they want. Um, also that schools could provide opportunities for students to anonymously report bullying. So students, you know, might be afraid to say something because they don't then want to be targeted. So that's another, you know, possibility and that um, teachers should be working to, to develop empathy in students in general, but also empathy towards the children or the students that have been victimized by bullies. So instead of piling on to have some sympathy that this you know, student had this, this thing happen, it was hurtful, and we wanna support that person instead of blaming them or um, continuing the behavior. So I wanted to ask you now to share in the chat if you have used or if you know of any effective responses to bullying that's worked for you in your context. Anything that you've said or done or seen someone else say or do that you have felt that has helped a group of students that you worked with or maybe even just helped an individual case. And I know you have some good suggestions and ideas if you've been working with, with students for a while. So being persistent and pointing out bad behavior, yes, definitely. No, don't just say it once, because then some students will test you. Oh, she said it once, but I bet you won't say it again. Or she just said it, she's not gonna interrupt the lesson again. You have to be really persistent at setting those boundaries, especially in the beginning, when you're first setting a boundary about a certain word or a certain behavior, for sure. What else? So Agnieszka said, I heard a few times uh, children using bad language in the classroom. One second, so I can read this. They were laughing at someone in class, so I stopped and immediately telling them it's not funny and that I won't tolerate this kind of behavior in my class. So that's great. So you immediately responded and let them know that there's no tolerance. So it's a very strong message sent to them. And that's great. That's really good. Um, I usually say it hurts your friend's feelings and he or she should apologize. Okay, so reminding students that there's a consequence um, to what they've said, telling them that they should apologize. Okay, so you can continue if you have any more suggestions to put them in the chat. I'm gonna go uh, finish a little bit because I have a few more suggestions and resources for you. And then we'll have some more time for comments and questions before we finish. Okay, so these are some more tips uh, in addition to what you'd said is that um, one thing is, especially since you're teaching students a different language, there are probably a lot of words that the students don't know are inappropriate. And every, anyone who's ever learned another language knows that there are some words that to you, they seem fine, or maybe the translation into your first language isn't that big a deal, but 
Um, in another language, it can be much stronger or it can be a slur. So, um, you know, depending on the student, depending on the situation, uh, first, we should always, we shouldn't necessarily jump immediately to assume that, of course, that student knows that word is wrong. We should want to give some, um, you know, educate them first. So make sure we educate the student that, you know, you can't use that word, whatever, um, and or use the behavior. And, and maybe that student in other classes was allowed to say that word or was allowed to act that way. Maybe other teachers didn't ever stop students from bullying others. Uh, maybe they've heard adults at home use certain slurs or say certain things about certain groups of people and they had no idea it was, it was a bad word or that it was um, something that could, could be considered discriminatory. So we have to make sure that we're, you know, that we are, um, that we aren't, you know, overreacting at first or we might just end up um, upsetting the student who, who did something completely out of, of lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. Um, and another thing that was really powerful me, for me when I was working with very young children is that, um, you know, we're, we so often focus on the child who's bullying. Like, you know, we, if, some, if a child is bullying another, we come over, we'll, you know, maybe, you know, chastise the, the, the child who's bullying um, or call out that child or that student and then they get a consequence. And then the, the student or child who's just been victimized usually is just kind of on their own. Um, so one school that I worked at with really young children was um, their philosophy was to empower all the students so that none of them would be easy targets. So I remember there was a, a boy who kept bullying this little girl. And, and I observed the reaction from another teacher was that the teacher talk to the girl mostly. She spent most of her time with the girl and said, if someone comes up to you and says that or does that to you again, you just use a loud voice and you say, I don't like that. And so the, this girl was trained to be more empowered. And she did indeed learn to start saying like, I don't like that and using a louder voice. And the boy ended up leaving her alone. So I think that's another thing. We want to empower students to be stronger, to be more assertive and confident um, so that you know they're not attracting um, people who will bully them. Because I think a lot of times bullying happens because the person knows that that person won't say anything, that person won't defend themselves and they won't speak up. Um, and if you notice some of your students um, are standing up to bullying or you have students that call others out, make sure you echo their message, repeat uh, what they've said, affirm that, yes, Allison, thank you for speaking up. We, we don't use that word in this class, et cetera. Um, and that really, um, that really reinforces the message that you're trying to send about bullying. Another thing is there's something called DARVO, which is deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And I think this is mostly maybe done with old, would be with older students and adults, but um, this, is the, this, this is the phenomenon in which someone has harmed someone else, but then they say, oh no, I'm the one who's the victim. So, you know, for example, seeing like in, with the Me Too movement, we had all these women coming out and, you know, being brave enough to talk about uh, being victimized. And then some people said, oh, but you're hurting the families of that man. Or what about his family? What about his reputation? So suddenly these women who'd been victimized were being viewed or being, being, um, being criticized for act, being the being the bullies, being the victimizers. So make sure that you know you know the situation. Occasionally, a student might claim that someone has has done something to them when actually they they have they were the one that did it first, or they actually had done something, and now they're claiming that by another student complaining about it or another student not liking them for their behavior, they're actually the victim. So it's not always so easy as you know seeing an incident and and knowing which person is the victim and which person is actually. Uh, the aggressor. And I see a few people made some comments I want to see in the chat. Um, so Sebastian said that asking questions is important because students who bully don't realize why they do it. Absolutely. I mean, I think ideally, you know, especially when we're dealing with something the first time, we come at it with a, a spirit of like, of, of, of open-mindedness and sort of generosity. Like, I don't think the student meant to hurt this person. I'm going to assume they didn't mean it that way, um, rather than immediately, you know, um, criticizing them. Um, and Agnieszka asks, what to do if older students bully others? They might not care whether we tell parents, their parents not might not care much either. Yeah, I mean, for different ages, you know, you have to think of what are consequences that those students would care about. Um, 
you know, would, are these students that 18, 19 year old, are these students that would care, that care most about what their peers think? Um, you know, are these students that you're just gonna, every single time they say something, you're gonna have to call them out and tell them they need to leave the room um, if it's behavior that's been repeated. Um, are they going, to, are there certain, I don't know, social events that they might um, want to attend that maybe they aren't allowed to attend? And um, if you feel that they, the other students won't be safe there or that the other students will feel threatened by them. Uh, does anybody have any advice, anyone who works with 18 or 19 year olds? So I assume you're talking about what, like undergraduates, undergraduate students, or maybe suppose could be some high school students. But if anyone has any advice for Agnieszka about that age, um, please put it in the chat. If you're talking about undergraduate students, because I haven't taught high school, for undergraduate students, um, I think just commenting on the behavior when it happens, but um, just before, okay, so last grade, just before university. Okay, so does anybody have any advice about secondary school bullies about to go to university? And if you do, please put it in the chat. Um, I mean, I would think Agnieszka depends on the students and, you know, have you tried confronting them in, in front of the group or pointing out their behavior every single time? Or have you told them if they're disrupting class, they have to leave? Uh, does the school have a policy for that sort of behavior? Or does the classroom have a policy? And if so, what are the consequences supposed to be? Um, you know, that's something that maybe if you might need some more like school-wide support for institutional support in terms of being able to have some sort of consequence um, with students of that age. But yeah, so if anyone has any advice for Agnieszka, please add in the, um, in the chat box. It's a really good question though. Okay, let me... I'm trying to go to my next slide and... Okay, so a few more example responses from the Learning for Justice that you could use depending on the age of the students. As the instructor, you could say, I don't like words like that. That phrase is hurtful. Do you know the history of the word? Making fun of someone's appearance, language, na nationality, et cetera, is bullying or it's discriminatory. We support each other here. We all have strengths and weaknesses. We support each other. Something I've done when I've worked with older students who, you know, sometimes some of the students might have higher levels of English and others have lower levels and they might be um, impatient, sighing, you know, rolling their eyes when the student answers. I've said things like, some of us are really good at speaking, some of us are better at reading and writing. No one has perfect English, not even me. So, you know, to kind of, some students just need that acknowledgement that they do have high level of, you know, literacy or verbal skills, whatever, but you need to explicitly let them know, I do not accept students being impatient with each other. I don't expect, accept students making fun of each other. And I've had to use that even working with adults. Um, you know, or to talk to the students about what your job is. My job is to make sure everyone can learn here. People can't learn if they don't feel accepted. People don't can't learn if they don't feel welcome. So, you know, you might have to remove it from it being about a personality difference or a personality issue and just remind the students, my job is to take care of everyone. My job is to create and maintain the safe space. So we need to make sure everyone feels safe. And students can, you know, uh, practice phrases and saying things like, I don't like that. I don't like words like that. That's bullying. We don't bully each other. That's not okay. Um, we're supposed to support each other, et cetera. Words kind of that are like more community-based or reminding each other of rules. Um, and in the Learning for Justice uh, resource, the link that I'll share with you, they have a lot of great scenarios for role plays with very specific um, situations, like situation of making fun of someone from a different uh, country, making fun of someone of a different race, making fun of someone uh, for being a member of the LGBTQ community, making fun of someone's femininity, et cetera. So if you want some really specific examples, they have a bunch there. I have a few general just scenario examples here for you um, because you could have students either write a conversation to respond to these or verbally respond to what would you say if you overhear a student tell another student from a different country, go back to your country. Or what would you, say, what would you want your students to say if someone is mocking someone from being, for being from a low-income neighborhood? 
Or what would you say if someone refers to something disparagingly as that's so gay, right? So you have students kind of do these responses and talk about what are good responses, what are appropriate responses, et cetera. Um, and I see I'm running out of time, so that's why I'm running through this. So um, another thing you could do is get some anonymous responses from students or have a box or an envelope or you know, let students know they can email you if they have any concerns about bullying or inappropriate language or behavior. So here are some of the sources and resources I have for you. There are also some anti-bullying books, which are great to use. Um, and American English website also has some resources you can use. US Embassy Warsaw Rilo Belgrade also on their social media has good resources. And if you would like the PDF uh, from today with the clickable links, my email is wbarnowski2015 at gmail.com, or you can connect with me on Instagram. So just wanted to see, does anyone have any questions or comments before we go? I see some of you gave some answers to Agnieszka about, depending on the behavior, it could be reported to the police, right? But as the last resort. Um, bullying comes from their problems. So if you get to know why they're bullying, because we know a lot of times people that bully, it's because they're getting bullied at home or they've witnessed that behavior at home. Maybe they weren't the victim of the bullying, but maybe they saw it at home. One-to-one uh, -one talk with a student helps. Start with your feelings and then talk about the per feelings of the person being bullied. Yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of times one-on-one -on -one conversation can really help uh, a student if they feel that you are listening and you care, that can definitely be the first step um, in that. So yeah, thank you all for giving Agnieszka some ideas there. Does anyone have any other comments or questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, um, what do you think about 13 reasons why as a resource for talking about bullying? Um, uh, you know, I'll have to see what other people say about that, Sebastian, because I haven't seen it, but I have heard some people have strong objections to using that. They think it's not appropriate and others have really enjoyed it. So maybe um, some more people who are teaching that age right now could give you some feedback on that. Uh, and thank you all for attending this evening. I know everyone's tired and the pandemic is lagging, but thank you so much for taking the time to attend the webinar, share your ideas. And I hope that all of you stay safe and healthy. Um, and then I get to see you again in a future webinar. Thank you very much, Willow. Bye, see you next time. I will get see in touch you. with you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs>
the final is going to happen uh, at uh, the international ITAFO Poland um, and conference um, on 17th of September 2021. Please remember that uh, this year ITAFO Poland is celebrating 30 years of uh, service to teachers in Poland and abroad and ask for the um, certificates for um, Willow Barnowski's webinar. Uh, you will be emailed them um, tomorrow um, or today at night. And uh, please uh, remember to check um, all the folders because sometimes our messages get caught somewhere uh, in the middle. So um, stay um, stay tuned, please visit our website and have a fabulous evening. Thanks for staying with us.